Thank you guys, always a joy and a privilege to join together and particularly to come and just share something from God's Word. We are in Genesis uh, chapter 22, verses 1 to 15. You can, uh, if you've got a Bible, you might want to just turn there. For, for 80 years, Abraham had waited for a son. And, and the, the pain of, of waiting for a, a child can be, can be quite devastating. And only those, I think, who have struggled um, to have children can really fully understand this. Rachel and, and I lived with this longing for over five years before actually our daughter, Rosanna, was eventually born, which is really rather insignificant compared to Abraham and actually to, to I guess, what many other couples go through. At the incredible age of 100 years old, God had provided a child for Abraham. His wife had become pregnant when it was physically impossible because of her age. A miracle baby was born that brought them joy and, and laughter. But now God is asking Abraham to give up on his dreams. If he obeys God, it appears that all of his future hopes will be shattered. Verse 20, chapter 22 and verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here, here am I. He said, take your son your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Now we, we can read these verses and we can actually completely miss the pain and the emotional turmoil that Abraham must have been going through. Yet he does exactly what God had asked him to do. There are no apparent arguments, no hesitation, no complaints or questioning. The truth is that very few of us, maybe if any of us, would have actually followed Abraham's example. Now, I think there are a number of reasons as to why we don't always listen and to and also obey God. One of the first reasons, I think, is because some of us are just arguers. We, we just like to argue. We get this in the optician sometimes. They're normally, they're normally the people who come in with mangled pair of glasses that look as if a steamroller has just demolished them completely. They are absolutely furious and they open up their case. They look, I've hardly worn these things. I just opened my case this morning and they just, just, just sort of disintegrated before my eyes. When we gently point out that they are at least five years old, they explode. Now, some of us would prefer to argue with God rather than to obey him. The thing is, most of the time, 
we know exactly what we should do. We, we know the right answers. We know the correct responses. But instead of obeying, we, we try to justify our disobedience. Listen, if you want to pick an argument, do not choose to argue with God. To argue with the Almighty, with the omnipotent, with the omnipresent creator of all things, you have lost before you've even begun. You cannot tell him something that he has not heard already. You can't shock him or surprise him. He is God. He is always right. He is good and just in all of his ways. And it would save us all a lot of pain and a lot of problems if we learned to listen to the voice of God and to obey him. The second reason why we don't always listen is because we think we know it all. Again, we get this in the opticians as well. A client comes in having read an article on the internet. They have self-diagnosed their eye condition. All they need from the optician is a referral letter, which, of course, they've already partially written in their own head. And I wonder how many times we have done exactly the same thing with God. And, and you convince yourself that actually you know better than him. So you face a particular problem in your life. And how often do you think that God should solve that problem the way that you want? After all, what would an all-knowing Lord of all who reigns with incomparable splendor, with absolute purity, with transcendent majesty, know about my problems. By the way, I am being sarcastic here. How silly we really are. Yet, yet we can still decide, you know, I'll do it my way. And today, we call that being strong-willed. The Bible calls it sin. And right at the very beginning of the Bible, God created this world perfectly, but Adam and Eve made the choice to go their way rather than to go God's way because they believed a lie and they rebelled against God and, and sin entered into this world. And the problem of sin and the problem of pride stops us from hearing from God. So even if God was to write in big letters right across the sky, some of us would miss it because we love other things more than we love Jesus Christ. The third reason is that sometimes we simply just don't listen. Now in the Old Testament, it was a much more common place for people to hear God's audible voice most likely because they didn't have the written word like we do. Today, we, we rarely hear God speak audibly to us, and yet we still use that little phrase, I've heard God say, or God has told me. And this can be perhaps a little bit confusing. It can send maybe the wrong message to new Christians, either because they think we have gone completely mad, or else they think, I don't hear God's audible voice. So, it must mean that I am not a real Christian. So I want to just be practical for a moment and explain how I hear God speak. Now, I have never heard God speak audibly to me. Don't think less of me for that. That's, that's just the way it is. But, but listen, it, it can happen. And I have heard some amazing stories. I've heard testimonies when, when people who are going through perhaps very difficult situations and God speaks to them in some sort of audible form. The truth is that God can get our attention however he decides. But more often than not, this is my experience. God speaks when we spend time in his presence. I, see, I believe the Holy Spirit can put thoughts and put ideas into our minds that can, can direct and can guide. He can use circumstances. He can use prophetic words from, from other believers. But we need to create space in our busy lives to hear and to listen to what God is saying. However, you would be a fool just to rely on your own thoughts and your own feelings in complete isolation or even to just take some sort of isolated prophetic word and then base your entire life on it. So when you feel that the Holy Spirit is 
directing you in a certain way or prompting you to do something, you check it out with Scripture. You weigh everything in the light of God's Word. Now, God will not speak to you or do something that is forbidden in Scripture. Let me give you a rather extreme example of this. If a man comes to me and says to me, God has told me to leave my wife and to move in with another woman, my reply will always be, without even taking a moment to think about it, is that's not God that you're listening to. Something else, but it's not God. Why? Because it simply does not stack up with what Scripture says. I'll give you a different example from another angle. Before I asked Rachel to marry me, I prayed, and I prayed for a sign from God to speak to me. Anything, just make it big, okay? My, my family were despairing. My mom in particular was just thinking, what's he up to? Poor Rachel was wondering, will I ever get around to asking her? The problem was that God did not seem to be saying anything specific at all. No lights, no fanfare, not even a big arrow in the sky pointing towards her head. That's not much to ask for, is it, surely? But that's what I was waiting for. But absolutely nothing came. Instead, this is what I think God was, was telling me. Wise up, Keith. Do you love her? Does she love Jesus? Well, then, what are you waiting for? See, the problem is I have this real skill in overcomplicating things, especially when it comes to hearing from God. The truth is that the primary way in which God will speak to you is through the Scriptures. God has given us his word in written form, 66 books of it, 1,189 chapters, 31,173 verses, 807,361 words, give or take, depending on your translation. Yet, yet still we think he doesn't have much to say. Listen, there's so much in the pages of this book. It is God's inspired and infallible written word. He, you will meet God through this book. You will meet Jesus in this book. The Holy Spirit will speak to you and lead you through this book. Listen, if you want to hear from God and you're not spending time reading and studying and meditating on the word of God, you should not be surprised that God is not speaking to you. So listening to God as you read is a deliberate choice to shut out the noise of our busy lives. King David, author of the book of the Psalms, wrote, we've heard this already this morning, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. In Psalm 143 in verse 8 it says, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Now, I really don't care when you take time alone, of God, alone with God. The important point is this. You will struggle to hear from God if you do not become saturated with the word of God and listen to the Holy Spirit. Make time for him. Make it a priority. Study the Bible. Teach it to your children. Memorize it. Love it. And as you hear from God, faith grows within us. Let's pick up our story in verse 4. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkeys I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. Stop there for a moment. You notice as Abram leaves his servants, he significantly tells them, we will return. 
before Abram has even walked up that mountain, his expectation is that he was going to return with his son. Now, I don't think in that moment that he knows actually what's, how that's going to happen, but he does know his God, and he knows that God has promised that through his son, a great nation will be born. And even though it does not make sense, because in sacrificing his only son, he will end his dreams, he will destroy his hopes, yet Abraham holds on to the fact that God had promised. And God had never failed him before, so in faith, he trusts him for the future. So Abraham does not put his hope in his son, he puts his hope in God, the only true God, who is the God of the impossible. Listen, faith comes not just from hearing, but by believing the promises of God. Now listen, if, if you put your hope in anything other than, than the unchangeable, the rock-solid power of God, you will fall. Your hope is not in your spouse. It's not in your boy or your girlfriend. It's not in your family or in your job. Those things, they will come and they will go. Put your hope in the only one who does not change, who gives absolute security, who loves you unconditionally. Put your hope in Jesus Christ. Verse 6. And Abram took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here am I, my son. He said, behold the fire and the wood, but, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abram said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. I think it's hard to put into words how Abram must have been feeling in that moment when he heard the voice of his son calling for him, confused and, and questioning over the issue of the missing lamb. See, to, all, to walk all that way and to forget the lamb, the very purpose for their, for their journey seems bad planning at best. The alternative is unthinkable. Yet Abram again shows his trust in God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, actually it sheds some light on what is going on in Abraham's mind. Referring to Abraham, we read, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. In very simple terms, Abram's faith allowed him to believe that God could and would perform a miracle. So I want to encourage you this morning to believe that even in the middle of the, the darkest of situations, you need to leave an open door of faith for God to do the miraculous. Listen, even in your pain, believe that God can still do the impossible. It may seem unthinkable. It may seem beyond the realms of possibility. You see, sometimes trusting in God and obeying his word can cut us deep and even seem crazy. But faith only becomes genuine when it is lived out. In James chapter 2 and verse 20 to 23, we read some very blunt words from James. James, in the book of James, is very blunt most of the time. He says this, you foolish people, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? To use the message paraphrase of this, it says, do you suppose that you can cut faith and works in two and not end up with a corpse on your hands? goes on. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? 
you see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. And faith is only faith when it's lived out. It's like that prophetic word already about stepping out down the path. It takes that first step. And Abram trusted in God and, 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 and God's grace was confirmed through his, through his actions. And this idea is repeated, of course, throughout the Bible. There are many commands, many exhortations to you to take responsibility for the way in which you live. Listen, you can't really just say, just let Jesus live through me, or that old cliche that goes on, let go and let God. Not that biblical, to be fair. You do have a responsibility. However, at the same time, I'm going to mess with your heads a little bit. You are completely dependent on the Holy Spirit to work in you and to enable you through his power to do the work that you must do. This is what D.A. Carson calls grace-driven effort. He writes, he says, people do not, will not drift towards holiness apart from grace-driven effort. People do not gravitate towards godliness, towards prayer, towards obedience, to, to scriptural faith, to delight in God. Instead, we drift towards compromise, and we call it tolerance. We drift towards disobedience, and we call it freedom. We drift towards superstition, and we call it faith. We cherish the indiscipline of, and, and lack of self-control, and we call it relaxation. We slouch towards prayerlessness and delude ourselves into thinking that we have escaped legalism. We slide towards godlessness and convince ourselves that we have been liberated. No one accidentally becomes godly or holy or are strong in their faith. This is not something we just stumble into. This requires effort and a heart that every day seeks to hear from God. But listen, human effort alone will always fail you. You need to be so careful that you do not step outside of grace and try to earn what Jesus has freely given to us. It's only the grace of God, the enabling of the Holy Spirit that will help us. It is grace-driven effort. It is Holy Spirit-dependent responsibility that shows that faith is real. And it is a mystery as to how he works in us, but he does work in us. And he enables us to work, to live by faith. And listen, that is not a mystery. Verse 9. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and he took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that, you're, that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and he looked and behold, Behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abram went and he took the ram and he offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. This story confirms Abram's fear of God and also the grace and the faithfulness of God, a God who provides. 
And it sets a glorious picture, a shadow of the grace and the love of God that all of Scripture is pointing to, summed up in those beautiful words of verse 14, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. God's provision on this mountain, which one day would become the location of the temple in Jerusalem, read about it in 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, but all of this is pointing to a, a glorious future. I guess the person who was most thankful for the ram that day was a young boy called Isaac. He owed his life to a lamb who died in his place. He was helpless, but God provided. And this is not just a wonderful end to a story, and it is a wonderful end to a story, by the way. It is also just an amazing picture of Jesus' redeeming work. Because of our sin, we are in the same predicament as Isaac. We have all done things and said things that deserve God's punishment and his, his righteous anger. And just like Isaac, our own efforts will never, will never save us. But God has provided a lamb to take our punishment. Jesus is the lamb of God. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, he never sinned. He fulfilled the, the scriptures in obedience to his father. He was unjustly treated. He was whipped. He was beaten. He was mocked. He was sentenced to death in the most horrific of ways. And although he was completely innocent of any wrong, he hung on a wooden cross and he died. You see, the demand for sacrifice and the provision of that sacrifice by God go hand in hand. In Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, it says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That is why Jesus had to die and to take our place. It was either him or you. Yet God so loved the world that he give his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And to be blunt, the decision is simple. Either by faith you accept Jesus and life or you face eternal death and hell alone. However, the the incredible news for, for all of us who trust in Christ Jesus is that you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 13. God has made a way so that our hearts can be changed. And, and it's, it's not through hard work. It's not through religion. It's not through self-effort. It is through Jesus Christ. And but, but what so many of us, what so many of us try to do is, is something actually very different. We try to fight sin in our own way by our own strength. So what we do, or what we at least we end up doing, is trying to fight sin with sin. To help explain what I mean by this, I want to give you two examples. I've borrowed them from the pastor and director of X29 Network, Mark Chalner. The first example is primarily for men, the second for women. But of course, there's always going to be some overlap here. There are so many men of all ages who struggle with lust, and the outlet for that is very often pornography. Now, this is not true of every man, but it is certainly, certainly a much greater challenge for men than it is for women. It's a huge problem in our society, and Christians are not exempt from this temptation. But here is how most men try and fight it. By his own will, in his own power, he tries to beat lust and beat pornography. So he constructs a boxing ring, and on one side of the ring he puts lust. On the other side of the ring he puts self-righteousness. The problem is, regardless, regardless of who wins, sin wins. Second example, 
Now, women are probably much more compli- complex creatures. Yet they've got to acknowledge there's always a danger in any type of stereotype. <laughs> However, Matt describes how he asked a number of women what the equivalent would be. The majority of them answered with fear and anxiety. I asked Rachel the same question in the past, and she agreed that many women struggle with, 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 in this area. So how do they deal with it? Well, in one corner of the ring, they put fear and anxiety. In the other corner, they put control and manipulation. And the result is that she takes all of her anxieties about her life, about her work, about her family, and she sets all of those fears up against control and against manipulation. So she ends up trying to control her circumstances, manipulate her situation in order to try and just alleviate her fears. And yet, When she realizes that she is controlling and manipulative, she lives in fear. And either way round, guess who wins? Sin. Every single time. Now, it might be a great fight, but in the end, sin wins. And listen, this is a popular game. You can maybe add in your own some of your own examples of of perhaps what maybe you feel challenged with. But when you try to put sin to death, and listen, we should put sin to death, but you put one sin up against another sin, the only problem is sin wins and you lose. And this is why we must go back to the cross of Jesus. He paid this huge price for sin by his blood. He died once and for all for your sin and for mine. So when you come to him by faith, when you repent of your sins, repenting of religious attitudes and ask Jesus to forgive you and to And to make you clean by his grace in the power of his spirit, sin is put to death. And and you can try as hard as you can. You can pit one sin against the other. You can be as devoted as possible. You can be as religious as you want to be. But But it will not change the source of your problem. Only Jesus can change your heart. That is why we need Jesus. In Colossians chapter 1, it talks about being taken out of the kingdom of darkness and put into the kingdom of light. In Ephesians, it talks about being brought from death to life. This is a supernatural heart change, and it is done and is not done by your own efforts or just trying a little bit harder. It comes through faith in Jesus and delighting in him and finding your joy and your satisfaction in him alone. It is the transforming work of the Holy Spirit. It's what Jesus calls being born again. And I believe this morning that many of us need a fresh encounter with Jesus and for our hearts to be softened And to be changed. You need to repent of your sins. You come to the cross of Jesus and receive his forgiveness. Listen, this is a place of healing. This is faith like Abraham. It is a faith that hears, that believes, and trusts in God. The God of the impossible. You have one hope, and his name is Jesus. Let's stand together. We want to just pray. I want to just invite those that do not maybe have never made a decision to follow Jesus, to to pray with me in a moment, but perhaps also there are those this morning and you have just walked away and you just need to come back. You just need that fresh encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm going to read or say a prayer out loud. I'm going to leave a little bit of space at the end and together, all of us, 
okay? Or everybody just pray together. You, it um, helps those that perhaps are maybe praying this for the first time. Let's pray it out together. But first of all, I just want to invite Holy Spirit, come. Come and move. Lord, where there is sin in our lives, and Lord, there's, Lord, there's sin in all of our lives. But Lord, particularly for habitual sins that need to be broken, we want to pray this morning, Lord, that you would come, Holy Spirit, just expose those, but also, Lord God, bring your healing and your forgiveness in these moments. So let's, let's just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I confess my sins and ask for your forgiveness. Just take a moment now just to perhaps just speak to the Lord. Please come into my heart as my Lord and as my Savior. Take complete control of my life and help me to walk in your footsteps daily by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and for answering my prayer. Amen.